Sit down. Um, I will eternally talk about eternal inflation today. Rob has given me permission to go on forever. Um, eternal, yes, yes. <laughs> eternal in inflation is a, a quite a different creature than ordinary inflation, the kind that uh, we measure in CMB and so forth. I'm going to completely ignore questions of ordinary inflation and ask the question, how many, well, first of all, eternal inflation is what preceded ordinary inflation, perhaps. That's the, that's the view I would take. Um, and it created many, many pockets, lots of pockets, a big multiverse, all that kind of stuff. And the question is, how many different kinds of eternal inflation are there? The answer is lots. I mean, if you just go in the literature, you'll find a zillion different kinds, for one thing. Uh, the question is, how similar are they? Are they characteristically different in some fundamental way? Are they all pretty much in some same universality class? Universality class, I use that term uh, now in more or less a statistical mechanic would use it. Are they in the same universality class? Are they different phases? Is the phase diagram, as a function of the parameters of the theory, complicated? The answer is probably very, very. Uh, and in order to limit the discussion and try to organize a small little piece of the question, we're going to work with a model. And this model is everybody's favorite model, just a potential with two minima, but simplicity, one of those minima is going to be at exactly zero energy. In other words, zero cosmological constant. I'll come back to the limitations that the non-zero cosmological constant would uh, imply for observing any of the things that I'm going to talk about. Basically, it will tell you you'll never observe them. You can leave. <laughs> Um, the question goes something like this. Here's our model. We have a potential of the usual kind with a big barrier that uh, requires tunneling to go through in the usual way. coleman delucci tunneling can uh, take a false vacuum and create a bubble of ordinary vacuum, of, uh, of true vacuum. I'll call the false vacuum the white vacuum and the... Um, uh, the zero cosmological constant, the black, va the black vacuum. The black vacuum I think of as being dead. Dead in the sense that it's no longer inflating. The white va vacuum is alive, it is inflating. Okay? Um, but what I want to study is the behavior of the theory as a function of the height of that potential. What happens is you raise and lower that potential. Now, what I'm going to be talking about, at least the first part of it, is by no means new. Uh, it's generally expected. Uh, it goes way, way back to the first ideas about eternal inflation. Very beautiful analysis was, was uh, done uh, by uh, Leonardo, and uh, et cetera, everybody knows, uh, of finding that phase transition discussing the order parameter for that phase transition, discussing it as a, as a, um, as a uh, statistical system. And basically, that's the situation uh, that I want to discuss. The behavior of the eternally inflating vacuum as a function of a parameter where you raise and lower the potential. Now, what changes as you raise and lower the potential? What changes is the nucleation rate. High potential, small nucleation rate, low potential, fast nucleation rate. So I'm simply going to think of this as, a, as an exercise in asking how eternal inflation behaves as a function of the nucleation rate, but in particular, when you get into situations where the nucleation rate is really quite fast, where it gets comparable to the expansion rate. All right, one picture, which is surely true, is that there are two behaviors separated by a phase transition. One phase we can just call no eternal inflation, and the other phase we can call eternal inflation. That transition is expected 
and I'll show you why, it is expected to be a fairly smooth transition, and it's for that reason that it's possible to approach the transition point more or less perturbatively or semi-classically and get some idea of what the transition is like and what the order parameter is just on the other side of that transition. Now, as it turns out, and you will see, that's the most complicated place, incredibly complicated uh, behavior in that region there. But still, it, you can access it from the no, inter, no eternal inflation side in a reasonably smooth way. The question that I had raised quite a while ago and was never really able, comfortable answering or was able to uh, find an answer to was this, is there any, uh, I, I need a pointer. Ah, oh, the hockey stick, okay, good. Yeah, I know. This is not my first uh, experience playing hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's not. But, uh... Right, the question is what goes on in here? Is there more structure to the phase diagram in there? And yes, I believe there is a lot more structure to the phase diagram in, diagram in there. For the very simple model that I described, where there's really only one parameter, namely the nucleation rate, it seems that there are three phases, which I will call the black island phase, the tubular phase, the white island phase, and the no eternal inflation phase. And I'll show you where these phases come from, what they mean, and why we think we know a good deal about them. Uh, so let's start with the sitter space. There's a chunk of the sitter space. Now, of course, I really want four-dimensional the sitter space. This is three-dimensional the sitter space. The top represents infinite time. Time equals infinity. Uh, this, I suppose, is some three-dimensional version of a conformal diagram. I just want to draw it uh, uh, so you can see some, you know, some three-dimensionality. I want to draw it four dimensions, but I can't do it. Anyway, time runs up. Uh, the horizontal plane on the top is asymptotic infinity. Now, asymptotic infinity is going to play a big role. Basically, what I'm going to tell you is there's a, a statistical description of eternal inflation that has to do with time equals infinity. You can call it holographic if you want, but I wouldn't call it holographic. I would just call it what it is, a statistical description of what goes on on the future boundary. Okay, now what does go on? What does go on in an eternally inflating? Here's one version of eternal inflation. Just bubble nucleation, coleman de Lucha bubble nucleation. coleman de Lucha bubble nucleation creates a bubble. The bubble expands out with close to the speed of light, accelerates, and eventually collides. It takes an infinite time, but nevertheless, eventually collides with the t equals zero surface, t equals infinity surface of the future of the de Sitter space. I will take that region, that collision region, or not, it's not a collision region, but the region that's blocked out by the black vacuum, remember the black vacuum is the non-inflating vacuum, I'll just block it out and make it black. In this picture, it's two-dimensional. In a three-dimensional world, three plus one-dimensional world, this disk would become a ball, a black ball. Uh, and not just one of them happens, but many of them happen, uh, and I think most of you know the story. The question is, what is a statistical description of the population of these black disks on future infinity? What is it like? Do we have any handles on it? And are there phase transitions between the different possible, uh, possible phases of this? I'll call it a statistical mechanical system. However, it is not a conventional Boltzmann statistical mechanical system. We we'll call it statistical because it's statistical, and we we'll call it mechanics because it's mechanics of some kind, but it's not a conventional statistical mechanics of what goes on up here. No. Once you're in here, you're in there, and you can't get back out. No, but I can't nucleate a bubble inside it. Oh, I will assume, all right, for this simple model, we will assume these are what people call terminal vacuums. Okay. We'll assume. Right. Okay. Is there a mathematics to this? Yes, there is a very beautiful mathematics to it. The mathematics to it, or a, a simple version of the mathematics, a very tractable version, 
attractable version because it's laid out on a lattice and there's a lot of simple mathematics to it, a lot of simple but sophisticated mathematics to it, uh, was worked out by people who had no idea that they were doing cosmology. In fact, the Mandelbrot percolation model uses a language which seems to have to do with cheese making, the curds and the whey. The curds, I don't remember if the curds are black and the whey is white, I don't remember. But it's extremely powerful for cheese making. Uh, so the Mandelbrot percolation model was announced in one of Mandelbrot's books. Okay. And it's a very, very powerful model for very simply discussing eternal inflation. Again, in the context of cheese making, it was solved both in two dimensions and three dimensions. We're really interested in the three-dimensional case, the three-dimensional infi infinite boundary of, uh, of uh, the end of time. It was solved by the mathematicians Chase, Chase, Grannon, and Swindle. And I can tell you the paper is no swindle. It's a really beautiful set of papers. Uh, using elementary mathematics for the most part, but in a very sophisticated way. And I will mainly restrict myself, uh, except for here and there, an example or two to the, uh, to the results. But the results you can picture. They're not hard to, to, too hard to understand. Okay, here is the model. Here is the, this is a particular version of the Mandelbrot percolation model. Start with a square. You can think of that as the uh, throat of the sitter space, the start of the sitter space, if you like. It's finite, and we're going to break it up into four cells and counting? Oh. We're going to break it up into four cells, but in fact, since we're doing three dimensions, we're really breaking it up into eight cubes, two times two times two, eight cubes, and with a probability P, with a probability P, we're going to kill a white cell. Kill a white cell means make it black. Black is no longer inflating. It's what sometimes are called a thermalized region or a region which is no longer inflating. And so in this case, I, uh, with a probability uh, less than one, I colored this corner black over here. Then, having done that, you take all of the white squares that are left over and subdivide them again, subdivide them by a factor of two. In the original models, the original mathematical models, you can subdivide them by factor n. But we'll just do factor two. That creates for each white cell eight more cells. And then you go to each one, and again, with the same probability p, you go through the lattice and kill cells. All right, so here we've killed another smaller cell and another smaller cell. These, of course, correspond to bubble nucleations taking place later and later in a scale invariant fashion. And eventually, you will subdivide every white space arbitrarily many times and create a very complicated fractal. And it will look like something like this after, uh, what is that? It's after uh, two or three iterations. I don't remember. Okay, first question. What is the probability for any survival at all? What is the survival means survival of the inflating regions? One possibility is that the first round here accidentally blackens every square. It's dead. It's not inflated. But that's not inevitable. It's not inevitable. It may, some escape may take place. What is the probability that, uh, that the system continues to go on and on, that offspring continue to populate uh, the, uh, the system? All right, that's easy to compute. The number of offspring of each cube, each white cube, is 8. It just divides into 8. On the other hand, there's a probability P that each, uh, I hate to use this word, that each child gets killed. <laughs> uh, so the average number of survivors is 8 times 1 minus P. If the average number of survivors is less than 1, the system becomes extinct, for sure. So extinction means 8 times 1 minus p is less than 1. And in this case, it tells you that there's a critical point at 7 eighths. That critical point is the point that separates no eternal inflation from eternal inflation. Okay? If p is less than 7 eighths, 
then with a high probability, the system will continue to evolve. If P is greater than 7 eighths, it will definitely go extinct. That's the basic transition between inflation, well, sorry, between eternal inflation and no eternal inflation. This transition, you can work it out, you can work out its properties, is second order. Second order means that it's smooth, it means the probabilities are, are smooth and you can estimate from either, from either side. Nothing, nothing um, abrupt happens at that transition. Okay, let's go on a little bit. Uh, let's continue that. Let's continue studying uh, the situation when you're on the eternally inflating side. All right? Eternally inflating side, let's suppose the system undergoes many, many iterations. For all practical purposes, the checkerboard has become infinitely big. Let's take it to be infinitely big. And let's ask what happens. What is the volume? Now, I mean the coordinate volume. The coordinate volume, not the proper volume. What's the coordinate volume that's occupied by live cells? Well, the answer is if the volume occupied by live cells after the nth iteration is Vn, then after the n plus first iteration, the volume will be 1 minus p times Vn, the coordinate volume. You lose coordinate volume each time. And after n iterations, you get 1 minus p to the n and that always goes to zero. But that's the coordinate volume. Remember, the cells are getting smaller and smaller, so you can ask the right question, if you want to know how much stuff is going on at late times, is to ask, uh, well, well, first of all, the volume of the inflating region does go to zero, and that means as long as something survives, it will be a fractal of dimension less than three fractal of dimension less than three. But we can count the number of white inflating boxes that are left over, and it's just eight times one minus p to the nth power, and that goes to infinity if p is greater than p, uh, if p is less than p critical, sorry, if p is less than p critical, p is less than p critical, yeah, I have this backwards. If p is less than p critical, the number of inflating cells goes to infinity, that's the same statement as the volume of, uh, of inflating space uh, uh, goes to infinity if you have eternal inflation. All right, so let's now start thinking about the various phases. The first phase that I discussed was no eternal inflation, where you get killed, where you go extinct. Uh, now let's come to what I'll call the Black Island phase. Now the Black Island phase is the opposite extreme. When the probability for making for a bubble nucleation or for killing a cell is extremely small, then what do you expect to happen? Then you expect blackened cells, dead cells, to be very, very sparse. Very sparse. If the probability for blackening a cell is extremely less than one, then it may take you 100,000 iterations before you even blacken one cell. And then another 100,000 uh, to black in uh, another one and so forth. So the black cells are going to be extremely sparse. Call that the black island phase. It's the phase in which the thermalized regions are very rare and most of space continues to, uh, to inflate. Okay. Now, it's a little more complicated than that. No matter how small P is, collisions are inevitable. Collisions between, uh, between cells. A colli here's a collision. This is what I mean by a collision. Two black cells touching each other. They are inevitable, and the reason is simple. If you wait long enough, the edge of this black region will get populated by a huge number of white cells. And no matter how small the probability for blackening a cell is, you'll sooner or later create a cell that hits your black region here. So collisions are inevitable. More than that, an infinite number of collisions around the boundary of this thing are going to take place, but they're going to involve smaller and smaller and smaller structures uh, that uh, become sort of invisible to the eye. Not only do collisions happen, but topology happens. Topology happens in which uh, the, um, the blackened cell or the boundary of the blackened cell can have a higher topology. This was discussed uh, by uh, papers by myself and, uh, I don't know, 16 different authors. 
how higher topologies can happen in eternal inflation, but here you can see, you just see what happens. However, despite the fact that collisions happen, the black regions continue to form isolated, disconnected um, islands. All right. That's called the black island phase, and I'll tell you how the mathematicians characterize it. Now remember, this is not time vertically. This is a three-dimensional picture now. I've drawn it three-dimensionally, and it stands for the future infinity. Future infinity is three-dimensional. Uh, these are the black regions. Everything else is a white region, and this is future infinity. And here are the uh, colliding cells and so forth. The mathematicians describe this phase, or they characterize this phase, by an order parameter, the order parameter being whether there exist what I will call white crossing surfaces. A white crossing surface is a simply connected surface which extends infinitely from one end of the geometry to the other in all direction, in, in, in two directions. In other words, because these things are sparse, you can lay in there a two-dimensional surface which remains everywhere in the white region, never hits a black thing, and which cuts right across the geometry. That's the, uh, the, the characteristic that, uh, that the mathematicians use to describe what I've called the black island phase here. Now, let's go a little further and increase the nucleation rate a little more. We increase the, not a little more, but we increase the nucleation rate until bubble collisions start to become frequent. Bubble collisions become frequent, and we're going to analyze it in stages. In the first stage, we're just going to take a single time band here, a single time band whose duration is about one Hubble time. This would be one Hubble time on a conformal diagram, White is out here, black is in here, and only consider those bubble nucleations which take place in this band. Then we'll add the next band, then we'll add the next band, then we'll add the next band, but for the moment, just take one band. That problem, the mathematics of that problem of laying down randomly cells on a checkerboard, right? laying down random cells on a checkerboard with probability P is called the percolation problem. Technically, it's site percolation. But it's called, it is a percolation problem. And what happens is percolation clusters form. What a percolation cluster means is just a connected set of boxes. Incidentally, it's an interesting point. It looks like there's an ambiguity. Do you consider this to be connected to this or not? Well, you might as well consider it to be connected because eventually it will become connected. As you subdivide smaller and smaller, eventually a little black box will appear in the corner here. So you might as well take it to be connected. There really is no ambiguity. This is a percolation cluster. This is a percolation cluster. This is a percolation cluster, and so forth. Now, what happens as you start increasing the probability for nucleation is the percolation clusters grow. The percolation clusters, this is the one-step percolation problem. This is ordinary percolation as opposed to the scale invariant iterated version. As P increases, the average size of a connected cluster, a percolation cluster, or call it R, grows. There's a second order transition, a second order phase transition in ordinary percolation. This is three dimensional percolation. Second order phase transition at the point where R diverges, where the clusters become infinite. At that point, Mathematicians characterize it by saying the white crossing surfaces become interrupted. At that point, uh, the clusters grow together, or the clusters become infinite. They sort of grow together into an infinite structure, and they completely interrupt the white crossing surfaces, which, we could, which cut across the entire geometry. They interrupt them, destroy them, but the topology of the black region is what I will call tubular. Tubular means that if we, let's take the white region. The white region still has white crossing curves, 
I have a better picture of it somewhere. Well, I will come to the better picture of it. The structure that forms is called tubular. You'll see some pictures of it. I'll show you some pictures of what the tubular phase looks like. Uh, but for the moment, a phase transition occurs. The phase transition does not destroy the entire white region. What it leads to is a tubular structure, with an infinite tubular structure, which connects across the whole geometry, black ge or the black tubular structure. And um, it doesn't eat up everything, but there's one unique single infinite cluster and islands in addition. That's what happens uh, uh, at the ordinary phase transition of the site percolation model. OK, this phase, this next phase, as I said, is the tubular phase, and it's quite an interesting phase. Oh, these pictures here, I'm just going to uh, go back and draw the same, just go through it again with a different set of pictures that I hand drew because I like them better. This is just the, uh, the black island phase when the, uh, when the decay rate, or the probability, is very small. Disconnected isolated clusters, same pictures. Uh, this is the black island phase where lots of collisions happen, but the black islands maintain their individuality. They don't grow together, and white crossing surfaces um, can be drawn that cut across the entire geometry. All of this, remember, is at future infinity. All of this is a picture of future infinity. Here's the transition of ordinary percolation. Ordinary percolation, which only involves one iteration, the Clusters get bigger and bigger. They grow. White, uh, sorry, black islands exist, but also big, infinite, uh, worm-like or tubular-like uh, clusters form. Roughly speaking, the topology looks something like this. One big, infinite, tubular structure. It doesn't end. It goes on and winds around itself and so forth, together with black islands. That's the phase, the tubular phase, of ordinary three-dimensional percolation. And it really exists. It's a real phase. White is not completely destroyed. Black does not fill the space, but it becomes infinite. And uh... All right, now let's come back now to iterating this, where we introduce smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller little black islands. This is my attempt to draw. Here was, the tu here was the tubular phase to begin with. And now we introduce smaller and smaller substructure. The smaller and smaller substructure, if we are in the tubular phase, the smaller and smaller substructure will also be tubular and connect everything together. Now, it's possible that we were not quite into the tubular phase before we added the smaller substructures. In other words, before we went to n equals 2. Just n equals 1, then we subdivided the lattice twice. It is possible that even though we were not in the tubular phase, close to it but not at it, that by adding in the smaller objects, you will enter into the tubular phase. The smaller things may connect together things that uh, were previously unconnected. to the tubular phase? What value of p? Yeah. It's, it's uh, difficult to compute. But it's, it's, order, it's order a half or something like that. It's, uh, it's not a particularly special number. It's something like order a half. Okay, but the interesting thing is here that very close to the transition point, just below the transition point, the way things become connected together is not by the percolation clusters getting bigger and bigger, but by getting connected from things in between. Little threads form in between and eventually connect everything together without the clusters getting big. But they, of course, get big as soon as they become connected together, but it happens suddenly. The clusters, the maximum clusters, have a certain finite size. Then stuff fits in between them, and then stuff fits in between that, and then stuff fits in between that, and then all of a sudden, bang, the whole thing is connected together. And that's why, in the Mandelbrot model, the transition from the black island phase to the, uh, to the tubular phase is first order. Sudden, sharp, without warning. 
in the sense that, uh, that it happens without anything growing. Here's a more um, organic picture of what it looks like. And I suppose this could stand for any number of things, including the longer, uh, which has similar mathematics, I suppose. Uh, this is pretty much what the tubular phase of the Mandelbrot model looks like. At the first round, the first few iterations, you might create an infinite tubular phase together with islands. Here's an island over here. Tubes plus islands. Then the next round comes and makes smaller things, and those smaller things may connect the island to, let's call it, the mainland. Still, some smaller islands will be present, but as we keep iterating it and iterating it and iterating it, everything eventually becomes connected together, and it becomes one big connected percolation cluster. That's the character of the tubular phase of eternal inflation, or the tubular phase of cheese making. A, uh, mean. Why was the model invented? In the first place, yeah. You know, I don't really know. <laughs> I think it was just, it was invented because Mandelbrot wanted a method to produce fractals. Yes, yeah, so it's not at no, It was purely uh, purely curiosity about fractals, I believe. And then Shays and Shays and, and Grannon and Swindle got interested in it. The why it's an interesting statistical problem, and they cracked it to solve it. They solved it. Uh, and it wasn't the model for any system. No, not that I know of. But I, I suspect. By now, it has probably been used for other things, including, well, not she's making, of course, but, uh, but uh, I didn't try to track down the literature, so I don't know what else it was used for. It's a real natural low for eternal inflation. So you phrased the phase transition in terms of a global variable related to the topology of this the set, but yeah, is there a local right. is there a local In terms of the topology, in terms of the topology of the remaining inflating set, is there a local variable that I could use to characterize the phase transition? Okay. Percolation doesn't usually have a uh, local variable. But, uh, yeah. So this is a continuation to the question. Isn't this model, in fact, equivalent to some kind of cellular uh, automation model? Some kind of what? A cellular automation model. It is. It is. It's a. It's a, it's a stochastic uh, version of a cellular automaton. Remember, there's a probability. It doesn't, you don't know what to do with the next step except probabilistically. Right. So, yes, it's a kind of a... And incidentally, the final fractal description is not described by a field theory. It's not described by a conventional statistical system. Uh, so I would say that... Uh, uh, but it is, it is what it is. So is but, can, I, can I change the rules a little bit and still keep the, you know, the overall... Yes, you can change the rules a great deal, and in particular, you can change the rules to replace squares by just laying down disks. Disks, first disks are this big, next disks, disks are half as big, but you lay down twice as many, well, a uh, higher density of them. <coughs> yes, you can, and randomly, completely randomly. Uh, that's called uh, the second brand member of the model, but I couldn't penetrate the mathematics of that one. That was too hard for me. This one I was able to, uh, to follow the mathematics. So. Sorry, just to be clear. So the black island is where the, uh, the white is infinitely simply connected surface. That's Say it again. The black island phase is where the black the island phase, the white black, is yeah. simply infinitely connected. Then tubular is where the both of them are simply infinitely connected. And so that's the simply connected. They're connected. And in fact, there's a dual, a kind of duality. If the black gets is, becomes tubular, the white is also tubular. There's a kind of uh, symmetry there. If the black is island, then the white uh, has these white uh, surfaces. But you need to have an, at least one infinitely simply connected of each into in the phase. tubular phase. In the tubular phase, you have exactly one in the infinite in the infinite volume limit. You have exactly one infinite uh, percolation cluster, and the only reason why there's one of them is suppose you had two of them. Well, go out far enough, even further, and you'll find eventually that they'll connect together, just statistically. So there's really only one of them. Uh, just okay. One question: If I put the thing on a torus or something, it is a non-trivial problem of cutting the knot. Uh, 
I don't think, I don't think that the policy makes a difference. I'll tell you one thing that does make a bit of a difference, not a great big difference, is to put it on a hyperbolic plane. This is interesting because if, uh, you know, if, if this whole, if, this, if the ancestor vacuum, if the black vacuum itself nucleated from some previous uh, thing, you might be putting the whole thing on a hyperbolic plane. Percolation on the hyperbolic plane is very interesting. But not, not so different that it's, uh, that, uh, that we need to, uh, uh, to worry about it. Okay, so here's the phase diagram. Uh, just to remind you, the phase diagram, we filled in this region here. I think with fairly good confidence, I would say, that there's a large number, that this is robust, that this is rather robust, a black island phase, a tubular phase, and a white island phase. Now, the possibility that you might be able to concoct models where you would go straight from black island to white island or uh, and skip tubular, that's possible. That's possible, but this seems to be a rather robust uh, conclusion about uh, these, kind of, uh, these kind of percolation systems. All right, the last per the last transition. Oh, we didn't uh, we didn't do the last transition. Sorry, we didn't get to White Island yet. Now, White Island, we're going to find is very very strange if we have time. Uh, and of course, what is White Island? White Island is just a situation. It's sort of the dual or the inverse of the Black Island. You get so much black produced that all you're left with in the form of white is connected white region. Connected white islands. In this situation, there are neither white crossing surfaces nor white crossing lines. You could characterize it this way. You could also characterize it from the black side, but uh, but I like to I like to characterize it from the white side. So eternally inflating stuff doesn't get completely killed. It's still there, but it becomes surrounded by non-inflating stuff. This, again, is part of the rigorous mathematics of uh, this, this class of iterated, let's call it iterated, percolation models. And these, of course, keep getting broken up. They keep getting broken up. As the iteration goes on, they keep getting broken up and broken into smaller and smaller pieces, but the white set doesn't disappear. It's, there's something left over there that uh, that's... Uh, that continues to eternally inflate. This is... Vanish? I'm not sure the fractal that uh, in this... Uh, yeah. um, I forgot, I don't remember. I don't remember. Uh, the reason I don't like thinking about fractal dimension is because I think fractal dimension requires you to imagine a metric on a future boundary, but uh, I, I don't remember what the answer for that is. It's like a stationary yeah. process, yeah. which doesn't yeah. sound like a fractal. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think it uh, matters. <coughs> no. So, so Lenny, one thing that you're ignoring here is the byproduct of bubble collision. Oh, it's bubble collision? Oh, what do you mean by that? Like, you yeah. mean the interior of the bubbles? Well, I mean, when you have two bubbles that collide, there would be gravity waves and things like that. And what? Gravity waves and things like no, that. No, I am purposefully keeping myself out of the bubbles. One of the reasons for describing things from the point of view of this future infinity and characterizing the inflating set is, think about bubble nucleation. All right, let me draw bubble nucleation for you. Here's bubble nucleation. Here's another bubble nucleation, and so forth. The, whatever goes on in here may be very, very complicated. Here's a collision, very, very complicated, but the white region out here is out of causal contact with all the complexity. So studying it from the white side should be pretty much independent of the complexity that takes place inside the bubbles. Inside the bubbles is where all the very, very complicated stuff happens. But by focusing on the white regions, uh, I think we avoid that. Okay, so let's see, how much time do I have running around? Five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Ten minutes? <laughs> um, let's just talk about now the hard problem of what you see from the inside, not from the inflating region, but from inside one of these bubbles. What a, uh, what a idealized observer 
in a zero cosmological constant vacuum who has all the time in the world and is not constrained by his lifetime, by acceleration of the final universe at the end of uh, time, just flat the uh, no cosmological constant vacuum. Let's, let's just think about that. Here's a bubble nucleation, and here's our observer looking back. As time goes on, the observer looks back. He might be looking at some particular space-like surface. It could be the surface of less scattering. Let's not talk about less scattering. Just some particular space-like surface. And the intersection <coughs> of his past light cone with that surface will grow and grow and grow and eventually get out to infinity. These points here are infinity from the point of view of the FRW observer. Event. So this red surface will move out and in time, the observer will see more and more and more fine structure. We'll see more and more and more small angular stuff. This angular resolution will get better and better and better and eventually be able to see arbitrarily small, well, I don't mean his telescopes will get better and better, but he will be picking up regions of smaller and smaller angular structures and uh, that's, uh, that's what the census taker, we call this guy a census taker. That's what the census taker will see. He'll see smaller and smaller angular detail. Whether or not this is related to the RG flow of some kind of field theory on here, I won't get into now. Uh, but uh, this is simply the observational picture of what is seen inside the white island phase. This is the white island phase. And notice that the boundary of the, sorry, the black island. Black Island phase. This is the Black Island phase. Notice that the bound, this is the Black Island here. Notice the boundary of the Black Island is really infinitely far away. Okay? Infinitely far away, so don't get the feeling that these boundaries are nearby. Minkowski. Oh, I see. Yeah. An object of given physical size yeah, yeah, yeah. Far and small. That's right. That's right. <clears throat> you don't really see. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, it uh, comes uh, into his past light cone, objects of small and small size. That's right. Yeah. What he can see, I mean, you know, blind men see nothing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's, that's, now here's, here's the White Island phase, a little fancier with bubble collisions and maybe a little bit of topology and bumps due to bubble collisions and so forth. Here, here happens to be a topology that was created by bubble collisions. And let's look at the census taker's light cone as time goes on. He sees more and more. There's a later time. Looks back and sees a later time. Notice his past light cone is going to penetrate into this topology here, and sooner or later, he's going to see all the ways around here and see multiple, uh, multiple images and so forth. This is just the, the Black Island phase. But one would expect that all of this would be in very, very small angular structures. And uh, in fact, there's no chance of ever seeing anything like this. But, uh, but this is what the idealized model would say for the late time observations. So this would be a black island. Here's another edge of a black island. Here's the, the census taker's past light cone intersecting itself and seeing multiple images and so forth. Here's another black island. And here's a crossing surface. That's the, uh, that's the character of the, um, of, the, uh, of the black island phase. Here is the tubular phase from the inside, so to speak. Now, first thing. Think about a slice, I'm sorry this is so biological, but, uh, <laughs> but if you slice through the black region, through the non-inflating region, it's not as if you see some finite trunk of a tree. What you see is again a hyperbolic plane in here with a distance from the center, these are just, these are just supposed to be structures. As you move out away, again you see the hyperbolic plane negative curved space, and it's an infinite distance to the boundary. So uh, it's an infinite distance to the boundary, but the topology of the boundary becomes a multiply connected uh, boundary. And this is roughly what somebody on the inside, this is a cartoon of course, somebody on the inside, a census taker on the inside, looking out, would 
see his past light cone eventually cover this entire tubular structure, penetrating into the smallest detail, so the whole thing would eventually, given enough time, become visible. It's kind of a fantastical picture. What happens in the white island phase? The white island phase is the hardest one to understand. This is the one which is closest to slow road internal inflation. There, I believe, the inflating regions form islands. And when that happens, it's very difficult to unravel what happens, but here is what I believe happens. Here is a white island. Remember, the boundaries of the, of the uh, black islands are infinitely far away, negative curved spaces, and typically the boundaries are infinitely big. What I believe is true, and what we believe is true, having studied this, is that the boundaries of these inflating regions are, inf are infinitely big, but that when you look between the two of them, going from one to the other, you go through a wormhole. You go through a very big geometry, through a narrow neck, and come out in another big geometry. Well, I personally don't believe in traversable wormholes. So, what do we expect to happen here? We expect singularities to form. We're pretty sure this happens. That these white islands, these are inflating islands, get disconnected from each other by singularities, and the black region also gets badly busted up and broken up by singularities. This keeps going on. These regions fracture. They fracture further. They fracture further, and an observer in there, I, I really don't know what they see, but our guess, our guess is that in this phase, everything crunches eventually, in the, in the thermalized regions, that everything eventually crunches. We don't really know how to analyze this well. This is certainly the hardest of the phases to think about. Uh, and our guess is that the whole thing undergoes a big crunch in the end. Those are wormholes. Okay. Empty space time. What's that? Empty space time. What could be more benign? Well, you could say the same thing about a black hole. Yes, I could, yeah. but that's the singular regions. I see that, but I don't see what's wrong. Somehow, I think the well, look. I, I don't pretend to understand this. Is it related to the topological censorship conjecture? What you mean? Well, the topological censorship you mean the absence of traversable wormholes. Well, yeah, the fact that they collapse. So. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. so. That part. That's okay. that's yeah. You yeah. have an infinite yeah. nest of wormholes throughout this black region. Well, with time, as the census taker, the census taker's over here, he's looking out. And uh, he sees more and more crazy structure in the sky. Further and further away. Locally, I should care less. No, I, no, I think he gets hit. I think I think he gets hit by. Uh, I think no, I, I look. I don't know. This has been analyzed. This has been analyzed to some extent in a somewhat different context by Puso and uh, Freivogel. The the phase as adjacent to the slow roll eternal inflation. And there's reason to think that uh, that stuff keeps coming in at the observer and eventually uh, eventually hits him. The but only stuff that's coming in is gravitational waves. Yeah. There's big density perturbations on those scales. Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. Order one density perturbations yeah. are coming in. Mass yeah. density? Well, density no perturbations matter. of some kind. Only gravity. All right. It's done gravitational waves. But let, 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 me, let me solve the problem this way. Let me throw it out as an open problem. Exercise in space. Speech. Uh, yes, some student uh, take it as a good problem to solve. But, isn't there this result of wit, if I recall, uh, or maybe someone else, that even if you have a wormhole with no perturbations on it, it will collapse? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. simply that mechanism. That, that's that's true. Yeah. Okay. So that would probably be so. Student will solve the problem. <laughs> <laughs> Outside the wormhole, you're not in any trouble. Yeah, yeah, something's going on. I'm going to leave. I'm going to let it rest. I'm going to let it rest. It's very confusing what goes on. And uh, this was the point that got a little beyond our understanding. Okay, so here's the picture then. Here's the potential. Way up here, Black Island. Localized bubbles. They have topology, and they're fairly complicated if you look on the fine structure on their boundary. 
but basically Coleman the Lucha bubble nucleation is the right picture. You lower the barrier, you enter the tubular phase. You lower a little more, you come to the white island phase, which is very hard to understand, and you keep lowering it, and eventually you come to extinction. And you come to extinction. The only last thing I want to say about this is unfortunately nobody will ever see this, and the reason is very simple. We don't live in a world of zero cosmological constant. There is a bound on how much conformal time we have. And with that bound on conformal time, here it is up here, we only get to see a little bit of this surface here. And we are not going to look out and see all of this structure. It's interesting as a conceptual, my own feeling is it's very important to understand eternal inflation and uh, to understand the types and understand the various things that can happen. Uh, and I will leave it at that. Okay. Fun with eternal inflation. We have time for a few questions. Uh, your qualified phase transitions are first of second order. What kind of energy function are you using? For say again? For, to, to determine the phase transitions are first order, for example. Yeah. What kind of energy function? Are There's you... no energy function. This is not statistical mechanics. How do you qualify transition in first order? Then? Whether it's sudden or not. Whether, it's, whether, whether a correlation length goes to infinity or not. Hmm. The correlation length just below the transition, and the correlation length in a percolation problem is really just defined to be the size of the largest percolation clusters. The largest percolation clusters grow somewhat, a little bit, but then discontinuously they become infinite in the, uh, in the scaling variant. Uh, so the, uh, right. Jim? Are you suggesting that in the bubble, black island in which we live, we are able to see other colliding bubbles? Well, am I suggesting that? That has yep. been suggested. Do you think it's realistic? I, I think it depends on how many e-foldings of inflation there were and how... Uh, but, but if I can see it, it's something moving in the wrong direction, a blue shift instead of a red shift, something off. No, 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 right. it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's not good. If a bubble collides with us, there might be a domain wall. Yes. If there's a domain wall, the domain wall will accelerate away from us. Typically, the domain wall will accelerate away from us. That's a typical situation. I see. Uh, in fact, in the other bubble, it will also accelerate away from him. So, so we can see remarkable homogeneity apart from Kendall the fifth. Yeah. Despite this chaos of okay. bubbles running in the bubble. Right. Okay, so <laughs> right. Sounds... inflation tends to wipe out signals. There is at least one person I know who I take very seriously. It's Matt Cleban, who would like to believe there's some chance that the cold spot might be a... Uh, he's analyzed that. He, look, he knows that uh, that's, a, that's a, a, a long shot. But, so, well, and more, you know, the, the north-south asymmetry might be a large bubble. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah. What kind of theory do you think we need to describe the quantum state of this whole thing? I don't, know, I don't know that I believe the quantum things. states of the whole thing. All of this analysis, in all contexts, the analysis of global things like this is always classical, classical statistics, uh, classical stochastic. Sure. And um, the real, it's a really interesting question whether quantum mechanics makes sense. You've got this question on scales bigger than horizons. Okay, so I don't know the answer. I mean, these are deeper questions that I've been addressing here. And you know, somebody said it was a cellular automata. Well, it's a cellular automata with a, with a, with a coin flip. Uh, it describes some features of it, but there's more detail. There's more detail. Certainly within, within, a, within a horizon size, there's lots of detail. Right. Obviously. Okay. Okay. Oh. If you go back to your previous slide, as as you keep lowering the potential barrier, yes. at some point the thin wall approximation fails, and I can no oh, longer yeah. really talk about white versus black regions. So is it possible uh, that the white island? I mean, so well, is there a yeah. white island phase that? I think, yes, it, I think there is. Where yes, I, I, can, there I can still trust I this thin wall. Yes, I, I think I think you can still trust that there's a, a boundary on, on time-like infinity 
there's a boundary between the inflating places and the non-inflating places. Okay, it might be a sharp very boundary. Large. It's not a sharp boundary in the proper sense, but in the causal sense, I think it's a sharp okay. boundary. Okay, well, let's thank Lenny again.